It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam LaSant Show. Now here's your host, Sam LaSant. Hey folks, thanks for joining us again. I'm Sam LaSant. And remember, you get to watch us on HD now, channel 513, if you're watching us on the Service Electric Cable Vision uh, uh, channel uh, network, cable network. Uh, well, another show today, folks. We're talking about health. And uh, my guest today is Dr. Michael Mahoney, uh, general surgeon. Uh, and once again, I have to tell you, folks, the amount of doctors we have in this area, Lehigh Valley just continues to raise the bar, raise the bar. It's, it's amazing. And remember, if you want to watch all of our, uh, any of our health shows, there's so many of them, go to our website, ssptv.com, and just click on the Sam LaSan Show, and you'll see any show that we've done. But uh, today, uh, we're going to talk to, uh, I just met him this morning, uh, Dr. Mahoney. Doc, how are you? I'm good, thank you. So how do you like the area? Uh, so far, so good. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of home where I grew up. Yeah. So. Well, where are you from, Doc? Um, I spent most of my life in the Midwest, at least growing up, uh, mostly in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yeah. So kind of a medium-sized, small town, sort of. So your favorite team is my brother-in-law's favorite team, the Green Bay Packers. Yes, I'm a, I'm a Packer fan. I would have got run He's out of town. He's a diehard Packer fan. <laughs> That's the only kind of Packer fan, yeah. really. So. So you were uh, from Green Bay, Wisconsin? Yeah, I, was, uh, I lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin since I was young, went to college in the area, and then it wasn't until medical school when I moved away. So, okay, you're in high school, uh, you're a general surgeon, correct? Yes. All right, so, all right, now, when you were in high school, uh, when did you decide you wanted to become a doctor? Um, I've known I've wanted to become a doctor for quite a long time. Um, I would have to say a lot of it is probably due to the influence of my father, who's also a physician. He's in OBGYN. Okay. So I grew up in that sort of household. My mother was a nurse, uh, so medicine was You're just kind of, it. yeah, medicine was just kind of. You had no way out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's in the genes. It's so. in the genes. So, um, so, so yeah, so I, I knew kind of early on that I wanted to do medicine. Well, your, your dad's in one area, okay. Then you, did you decide to go in general surgery right off the bat, or, or did you just go into become um, a doctor? No, I, I kept an open mind about it. It's hard to make a decision when you're early in your, in your training. You have to really uh, get your hands wet, get in there and see what the different specialties have to offer. Um, and you have to pick the one that matches your personality. I like working with my hands. I like um, seeing results quickly. Um, and I just like the acute care aspect of surgery as well as the, you know, taking care of um, some more benign conditions, things like that. So I thought it had a great opportunity opportunity for me to do both. How long you practice in doc? Um, I just got done with my residency, which uh, residency is five years. Mm -hmm. um, I was down at Mercy Suburban Hospital um, down in Norristown. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that for five years and I finished my training this last summer. Um, and so I've actually just started with Lehigh Valley Network and I've been here in practice since December, so about two and a half months or so. In, in the practice, okay, when you, when you, it fascinates me because there's, you know, interviewing so many doctors, um, uh, the, 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 you have to have a passion for what you do, am I correct? Yes, it's, a surgery's a lifestyle, it's not a job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So going in, into surgery, okay, the, um, the ad advances they have today, okay, wow, that they didn't have even five years ago, I would think, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so coming um, out of the residency in, in, in your medical school, did you, are there new techniques coming down, down the pike here? Um, yeah, actually, um, one of the benefits of being in a training program now is you get to see a lot of the new advances with the new technologies as far as not just medications but equipment. Um, where I trained, it was pretty progressive as well. We had um, some surgeons that still did things kind of, a, I'll say, the old-fashioned way yeah. um, with you know, your traditional open techniques for big surgeries. There were other guys that were very... Um, into the minimally invasive stuff, the laparoscopic sort of things, doing those same procedures with little incisions and using the cameras. Mm -hmm. um, we also had the benefit of having a robot, which is kind of the new uh, trend in surgery. Um, it's another minimally invasive tool, um, and so I was able to train on the robot and get robotically trained. That's interesting. Yeah, so when you're talking minimal invasive, um, from the old school, people think, well, how could he, how could you take a gallbladder out or how could you do this, you know, just with a little thing like that, all right? You got to cut them open, you got to take, you got to see what you're doing, okay? You know, it's, it's hard to, you know, some fathom sometimes. Uh, so how do you put us at ease with that? 
Well, actually, uh, a lot of times with the, with the camera systems, um, you actually get better visualization, especially now with all the new HD technology, you get that real-time picture. Um, in, like, for instance, when you're doing a gallbladder, you're making an incision directly over the gallbladder, you get to see that area okay. But when I do a laparoscopic procedure, I can see the entire abdomen through a small incision, something that you can't necessarily do with the traditional open technique. And what does that allow you to do then? You can better assess the situation um, if you're not entirely certain what's going on. Um, you can see if there's another pathology going on, um, like for instance with hernias. Um, you can see do they have other small hernias that need to be fixed, saving them potentially operations in the future. The other thing that's nice with the cameras now is it's actually magnified too. So you're not just looking with your eyes, you're actually looking at something with some magnification. Mm -hmm. So you actually get better detail in some, some instances. So in your training, you know, did you train for that? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, a lot of the procedures are done laparoscopically by almost all surgeons. Uh, but then I also had a couple of attendings that did my training that were um, very well trained in minimally invasive techniques. What was your first one? My first... The first uh, operation. My first operation, um, I actually was assisting, um, as a resident, my first operation was assisting the uh, OB-GYN on a hysterectomy. So <laughs> it wasn't necessarily general surgery, but my first case as a resident was a hysterectomy. <clears throat> now, when you're talking about robotics, now that seems to be another interesting area. When people think about robots, they're thinking, well, you know, this, I don't want a robot attacking me, etc. So <laughs> how does that work? Um, so th there's a couple of different robot systems out there at this point, but essentially what it is is it's very similar to laparoscopic um, uh, surgery where you have your small little incisions with the access points. Uh, the difference is in the instrumentation. With the laparoscopic tools, you're holding the, the handheld tools, and it's essentially like using kind of chopsticks with graspers, if you will. Um, the, the robot allows you to have um, articulation of those, the ends of the tools. So that's essentially the big difference. The other difference is you're not holding the instruments, the robot is, you're holding the uh, handles at the console. Um, so, so you could be across the room. You could be across the room, yes. And, and in fact, you usually are, because the robot's, the console is, is away from the patient. Uh -huh. And that allows you to be more uh, precise? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's essentially like doing surgery with chopsticks versus doing surgery with your hands and fingers and twisting your wrists. So it's very safe? Uh, it's extremely safe, sure, in a well-trained environment. So what um, uh, procedures can or operations can the robot do? Um, essentially anything that can be done laparoscopically, where it really shines. So how do, how do you know that? That's the, that's the thing. How do you know what can be done laparoscopically? Um, I guess it's, de it's dependent on your training. It's depending on a, sur a particular surgeon's comfort level. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously certain things that preclude um, uh, laparoscopy. It's typically more the emergencies and that sort of um, uh, acute issue that you wouldn't necessarily want to tackle laparoscopically. but in this day and age, a lot of things can be done laparoscopically. What's the recovery time versus, you know, just cutting? Uh, typically, it's, it's less. Um, usually with a laparoscopic procedure, you're in the hospital less days. Uh, you have less post-operative pain, so you can get ambulatory faster. Um, so the, the overall recovery time is usually less. It's dependent on the procedure, but it can be considerable in, in some of the bigger procedures. Okay, so uh, as a general surgeon, uh, you know, you, you, you studied to operate on anything probably, right? And I ask you if you specialize anything and you said below the stomach or in the stomach Yeah, area. typically general surgeons <coughs> focus on the abdomen, the belly. They also do uh, uh, the breast work, mm -hmm. like for breast cancer and <coughs> things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, essentially the focus is in the abdomen, but we, we're trained to do a, a lot of procedures outside of there as well. When a surgeon is operating in their whatever, whatever they're doing, um, there's always this fear of cancer, okay? Now, um, I know you don't have X-ray X -ray eyes, but the point is, is there times when a surgeon who is either working on a colon, working on a bladder, working on the stomach or, or whatever, have, can see that there may be some cancer. I mean, I don't know what cancer looks like. Maybe it's a stupid question, but I, I don't know. If they had a, a large, obvious mass or something, then you could be working on something and go, oh, geez, that looks like a cancer. But even then, we wouldn't 
at least I wouldn't go out and say, oh, that's definitely yeah, cancer. You take a sample of but, it, you but, send but it to you, pathologist. You probably have a good idea though, right? Typically when you're operating, you already have a good idea what you're going after. So mm -hmm. usually you have the information before you go into the operating room. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're if you operating on something in the colon so, and you find out that, um, well, they, you, they do the test, right? And they'll find out if there's any cancer there, okay? Mm -hmm. But some doctors say, I think I took it all out. Okay, what do they mean by that? Um, so that means they had to see something, right? Right, you're absolutely right. So the when they say we think we got the whole thing, it means that what we could see with our eyes was completely taken out. There was no residual disease left behind that we could see with our naked eye. Um, and that's essentially what they're saying is we're pretty certain we got the whole thing. Now, in uh, medical school, uh, do they train you to... You know, look at certain things and you know do certain things when you're when you're doing surgeries because you're coming out with a lot of experience, which is great. I mean, experience in technology and experience in the new um, fads, not fads, but new procedures, I should say. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the are they ask? Uh, so I guess you're asking, do they train us to look at? Yeah, I mean uh, uh, the the total thing. So when you're you do on cadavers, cadavers, is that what you uh, do most of your surgeries on when you're in training? Uh, actually, ca the cadavers are more when you're uh, earlier on in medical school. That's more for your basic anatomy, trying to learn the normal stuff. Um, there are some cadaver courses mm -hmm. for residents. Um, however, a lot of what you're doing is on live patients. So you're actually practicing under the umbrella of your attendings, who are your mentors, and they're essentially in charge of everything, mm -hmm. but you're also working on live patients. You're not working on cadavers. The reason why I asked it, Mike, is because the more a person is informed as to what it's all about, particularly um, heart surgeries today, okay, I mean, in Lehigh Valley, I mean, they, they have a whole, they show you a video, they give you from A to Z what's happening, what's going on, etc. The same thing I'm sure you do with, for your patients, right? And yeah. explain everything. So the more you feel comfortable with, okay, um, it, it makes the patient feel a lot easier. And I think, you know, the younger doctors today, and I'm not saying that you're real young, but the <laughs> point you come back, when you come to the area with some great um, knowledge, okay? Uh, and I think that's, so you're, you're dealing with people who've been here a while, okay, doctors plus the new, I think that's a great combination, don't you think? Uh, yeah, I think it's wonderful because you get uh, essentially two heads on an idea versus just one approach. And medicine is much of an art as it is a science. So regardless of how much you've trained or what procedures you've learned, if you can take also somebody else's wisdom who's actually been in the trenches for years, um, they, that can be also a very valuable tool. They can give you um, real experiences and say, you know, I've seen something similar and this is what I did. This worked for me. This didn't work for me. And so you can really, um, you know, and you can also add to that, well, I learned this technique and they may say that sounds like it might be a good idea. So you can really kind of merge, you know, the old and the new, come up with some hybrid mm -hmm. ideas. Again, that uh, it falls into the art of medicine versus yes. just the that's the algorithm yeah. science of it. So one of my favorite shows on television is, is Chicago Med. My, okay. wife, my wife's a registered nurse, and, and we like watching that uh, program. We watched it, um, I think it comes on every Tuesday night. Um, how realistic, uh, do you ever watch that, the show? I or don't doctors watch it that? I, I, yeah, you I, see, you I, I learn stay away. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I stay away from a lot of those shows because I, I, I see things and I'm like, that's not right. And it gets irritating. Well, that's and... what I want to ask. I mean, so when you see these, you know, these people coming in and, you know, emergency rooms and what they do, et cetera, you know, uh, how much is that really real? I, I have to think the writers have to have uh, consultants that are telling them this is what, or doctors that are advising them. Wouldn't you think so? Um, I'm not well versed in that, but I would assume they, they do. Um, the, the few shows I've seen seem to be a little more... Uh, your a little more drama. I'm giving you a homework assignment. Okay. <laughs> your homework assignment for you and your wife's RN. Next, you watch that Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock. Okay? okay. All and right. I, and I want to know what your thinking is. Folks, I'm talking to Dr. Mahoney, uh, uh, who was at the Health and Wellness Center in Hazleton. Phone number there is 570-501-4LBH. It's great, folks. We have these great doctors coming into town, very personal, as you can see, uh, and uh, bringing a lot of great medicine knowledge to us. We'll be back right after this break. Welcome back to the Sam Sancho, folks. Today, where my guest is Dr. Michael Mahoney uh, from the Health and Wellness Center, Lehigh Valley Health Network. Uh, remember, folks, you can watch us now on HD 
Channel 513 if you're watching us on Service Electric Cable uh, in the uh, greater Hazleton area. Uh, also, SSPTV.com, you can watch all of our shows, including all of the health shows that we do. My email, Sam, at SSPTV.com. Dr. Mahoney, okay, now let me ask you this. Um, in the Lehigh Valley um, uh, Network, all right, uh, the physicians group that you're involved with, um, it allows you, your patients to, the patients to have a lot of resources that the Lehigh Valley Health Network provides, which that alone is, I think, is extremely important. Explain to the viewers why that is so critical. Well, it, it, it's good for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the big reasons are, one, it gives you access to all the care that's available right here in the area. But if there's a service that you need that's not readily available here, it's easy to find and get you connected with um, either the diagnostic or the doctor or whatever you need down at the, at the main campus down in Allentown. It's a huge campus. They have just about everything that you could possibly need down there. So it's, it gives you um, ready access to all that, um, all that health care. I'm reading here, Lisa <coughs> provided this for me, 50 physicians, okay? Um, the, the medical group, 50 physicians, advanced practice clinicians representing 50 medical specialties in 21 practices. And you know, you have um, over 1,000 physicians in, in, the, in the network, 47 medical specialties. I mean, you, you, when you're talking about I want to get a second opinion. <laughs> you're getting, you're getting <laughs> you second, third. <laughs> you know, you got second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth opinion, which I think is great. Now, speaking of that, uh, you know, I, I, that's why I think this is when Lehigh Valley came into the area. Um, I said from day one, it was just a great opportunity for our area. And when I talk about area, I'm talking about St. Clair, Monty City, ta you know, the whole our sure. northeastern uh, area up here. Um, the, 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 so when do you know to go to another source if you have, if you see a patient and you have a, a, a concern? Um, I, I guess it, 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 you fall back on your training and you really have to be honest as a physician with yourself. Um, this is out of my wheelhouse or if, is this something that I can take care of? And if it's outside of your wheelhouse um, or, or if you want some help or something, that's when you reach out because uh, the last thing you want to do is to start going into something not knowing or not feeling comfortable with it because then that's when you have bad results and then patients are unhappy or they get hurt and, and that's really that's really what the network is about is having uh, other resources. I have patients coming to me where doctors are like, hey, could you take a look at this? I don't know what this is. And the same thing, you know, I refer out. I say, hey, this is not my specialty. You need to go see this doctor. He's the one that will better take care of you. Uh, the key is recognizing at least on the outside level what the pathology is and then deciding is this something that I treat or is this something that I send to somebody else. Stay in that line, what made you want to join the LVPG? Um, I wanted to be part of a, a group practice. Um, again, you know, med I've been around medicine quite a bit and um, I just felt like I, for me that'd be the most comfortable setting for me, one to have access to other physicians and also to have, you know, be accessible for them. I thought it'd be a good fit for myself. Now, one area here, I, I, you know, you, you know, you're a general surgeon, but one of the areas that you talk about here is colorectal surgery. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and th here again, um, you, first of all, you're talking to the biggest baby uh, walking, <laughs> because when I go to a doctor, my blood pressure goes like this. You know, I tell you about my sinuses. I feel like there's a zillion things going on in my head. I'm a big baby. God bless women. <laughs> that, they are the strongest people. I'm telling you, God bless them. I would not want to be a woman today. They're usually um, the better patients. They are. There's no typically. question. They're, they're yeah. very strong. But let's talk about colorectal. You have colonoscopies, okay? Yes. Okay, now, uh, I have all these doctors coming on my shows. It took me three years before I went for my first colonoscopy, okay? Scared out of my mind, okay? was a piece of cake. It's easy. The worst part is the prep. Yeah, it was a piece. And now, you know, I go every five years or whatever. Tell me why that is. I mean, and I'm telling you, viewers, it was a piece of cake. It, you know, you, your doctor will tell you, you know, when, when should you go for a colonoscopy? Uh, well, the, the general guideline is um, unless you have a family history of, of colon cancer or a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease, standard screening starts at age 50. So when you turn 50, you should really be seeking out a screening colonoscopy. And 
Uh, the reason it's important is because that allows a physician to find a, a potential cancer at the early stages. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons I enjoy doing the, the colon work is because you can deal with benign disease but also the malignant disease that's very treatable. Mm -hmm. um, if you find colon cancer in the early stages, mm -hmm. it's resectable and you don't need chemo or radiation or any other adjuvant mm -hmm. therapies to treat it. Even if you catch it in a little bit later stages, sometimes you can treat it with chemo to help cure it, but that's one of the things I enjoy. As a surgeon, that's one of the diseases I can treat. Um, so again, that's why the screening colonoscopy starting at age 50 is really important because we can catch it early on in those stages and get it before it becomes invasive or, or metastatic. And in this area, uh, the colon cancer is high in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Yeah, the, the statistic for um, Northeast Pennsylvania versus other areas in the country, um, we have a higher incidence of the cancer. And I do believe that we also have a, a higher incidence of mortality from it, meaning it's not being caught early. So that's, yeah. you know, one of the real, you know, messages I hope people take home from, from here is, is get your screening colonoscopy. Well, you know, sometimes if, if person's having bleeding, okay, uh, you know, whether it's a hemorrhoid or whether it's a, a fissure or, or whatever, I think they panic, all right? Uh, and and sure. the point is that uh, immediately, if you do have any bleeding, I'm, here I am, Dr. Sam, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, I, maybe it could be an intern, I don't know. But if you have any bleeding, I mean, it's, it's nine times out of 10, you know, if it's red or whatever, I mean, it's something that you could be taking care of. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. One, you should seek, you know, a physician yeah. uh, uh, advice because you don't want to miss a malignancy or something. Yeah, yeah oftentimes we see uh, bleeding, rectal bleeding, and it's a benign issue like a fissure or a hemorrhoid, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be that one out of a hundred that has some sort of uh, uh, bigger issue. Well, it's, it's, it's certainly... Uh, a lot of it is preventable if they would go for a colonoscopy. I it, mean, it's, yeah. it, even if it's not preventable, it's still catchable at an earlier stage and, it's, and we prevent I the progression of a disease. Going into cancer, if, if they have a polyp or something, oh, yeah, they, absolutely. Get, they can get it out. Okay. Right, um, right. One of the things that uh, I use is the, the um, health portal. Um, and explain just briefly what that is. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I do know the portal is, um, it, it's a tool for patients themselves to log on to the, um, to the internet. They create an account and it ties into your medical records. You can access like your personal histories, um, notes, allergies, medications, how to take them that you've been prescribed personally. Mm -hmm. It also gives you access to any labs you may have had drawn, um, any images, like x-rays, things like that. And it also allows you a communication line. You can request appointments through the portal and you can also um, email, you know, like your primary care physician questions and they can have a chance to email you back. Now folks, if you want, I use it. I, I, I have my own uh, <clears throat> code, etc. cetera, but, um, and he's right. It gives you your complete history. Um, and if you need to know how to use it, you can always call the um, hospital 501-4LVH and tell them, you know, or your doctor, they'll um, tell you how to set it up. Uh, how do you find the area? How did, uh, yeah, you how mean do you mean the job? You, you, know, you know, the people here and... and uh, know. Everybody's been really friendly. I moved yeah. from the Philly area, so of course everybody's much friendlier. But <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it reminds me more of being back home in the Midwest. People yeah. have been very, uh, I guess, kind of warm and friendly, and it's been a, a, a pleasant change for me and my family, so. Well, growing up in, in a family that's doctors, you know what bedside manners are all about. And, you know, I mean, as far as people, you know, that's, you know, because they're nervous the way it is, but I think a doctor or anyone in the medical profession who shows a little compassion, uh, it, it goes a long way. And from what I understand, you're doing a, a, a fabulous job. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Michael Mahoney, folks, uh, if you want to uh, ask him any questions or get in touch with his office, it's uh, just dial the number 570-5014-L. Uh, once again, good luck to you and your family. Okay? You. We'll see you next time, folks.